everybody. Welcome to White Line Fever Kicks. And uh, later on in this program, we're going to hear from the uh, coach of Wakefield, the big Wigan last week, trying to avoid relegation, Mark Applegarth, and some good comments here about the signing of Josh Griffin, who, as we know, is suspended for abusing a ref. Uh, and uh, also John Wilkins saying at the start of the year he'd never heard of the bloke, and now he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's improved his reputation. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, don't forget to follow us uh, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Make sure you subscribe and also please support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash white line fever. On with the show. It's Molly, Tony Adams. How are you, Tony? Doing well, Steve. And I guess we should uh, tell those who don't know, uh, this is truly a, a global show. You're sitting in uh, the heart of London and I'm on the northern beaches of Sydney. It's uh, about uh, 10 o'clock at night here, quite chilly. Uh, how are things over there? Yeah, not too bad. Um, it's a bit overcast. We've got um, um, a niece's staying at the moment, Tony, so I had to wait for them to go out. And anyone who's watching who's got teenage kids, I don't know how you ever get into your own bathroom. It's very hard. I had to run across the across the road to go to the loo. Oh, else to <laughs> too much information. Too <laughs> much information. <laughs> so, uh, Tony, we've got to remind everybody to subscribe to this channel. It's new and we need your support. Uh, and um, also I uh, want to thank a, a, a viewer, Phil Rogers. Uh, he, he watched us on Twitter last week and immediately uh, became a patron. So that, that's awesome. At the moment, uh, the, play, the patron, uh, place you can support us on Patreon, Patreon forward slash White Line Fever. We might get one especially for this show a, a bit later. But, Tony, uh, 2410 New South Wales over Queensland in origin uh, yesterday. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, it was a, a must-win game for the Blues, wasn't it? They, they've lost three series out of four to uh, be clean swept would have been the, the final humiliation. I thought uh, the changes w were good. I, I, I went on record before the game, unlike some people, and said Bradman Best was a, a great inclusion. Cody Walker I wasn't quite so sure about, but, um, you know, I had Cody as man of the match. I did player ratings as in the old Rugby League Week style, and I gave Cody a nine and uh, Bradman Best an 8.5. I think it's it's really in the, in the outside backs thanks to Cody Walker, that uh, the, the Blues won the game. The forwards were, as you'd expect, a, a battle in the trenches. I, I didn't think there were any great standouts there, but it, it was in the back line um, where the, the Blues won it. I uh, remember that great try also by uh, Josh Adokar, who more than justified his recall after being brushed last year. Now, we pick up a couple of threads from our previous uh, couple of shows. And, and one thing which attracted a lot of interest, Tony, on social media was your own predictions about Brad Fittler's future as coach. Um, do we know any more after the match? Well, no, it's it's early days. As I said uh, when we last spoke about it, um, the next origin is uh, about 11 months away. So uh, the New South Wales Rugby League is in no hurry to make a decision. But I can tell you that last night's uh, year was a dead rubber, but it does have a bearing on things. They, they managed to just about fill... Uh, Acor Stadium, uh, the fans, 70, 80,000 of them, most of them went home happy. All, all the Blues fans thought, how good is this? We've won a game. So, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, a feel-good vibe uh, in New South Wales. And the other thing about Brad Fittler, he, he's a lovable larrikin. I think, um, you know, he, he, even his critics will admit he, he's good for the game. Um, I actually had a long chat with his wife today. She rang out of the blue just for a chat and uh, just to tell me about the, the pressure he'd been under all year and how he just goes out, out to all these far-flung places in the country, uh, you know, running around with kids, uh, doing clinics. Uh, and she said, well, would any other New South Wales coach do that? And my answer was probably no, because Freddie's just that sort of person. He, he genuinely loves rugby league. He loves the public. Uh, the people love him. So even though he has lost three out of four series, it would be a big call to sack him. And I think all this will come into play when uh, uh, David Trodden and the New South Wales Rugby League uh, hierarchy sit down, probably around Christmas time to decide what their next move is. Now, yeah, before I move on to the next point too, Tony, we normally read through some uh, pay, uh, Patreon supporters, um, but I haven't got the list in front of me, so 
I'll have a look in the in the description uh, for the pat Patreon supporters, but we'll be better prepared next week and uh, I will read through them. The second thread uh, that I wanted to uh, bring up is moving on from that is the RLPA action with no uh, interviews. And, you know, I, I would have personally, being old school, I would have liked to have heard, heard from Braddon and Best. I would have liked to have learned, you know, who he most credits for getting him there. Uh, you know, whether when he was backing up James Tedesco's break, whether he shouted anything, what he thought about having a try disallowed, how that affected his confidence, what was said to him at full time, how many messages he had on his phone uh, when he turn, turned it on. Um, I would have liked to have heard all, all that, um, but I understand why we didn't. And, I, and, and I'm not blowing up. I'm not joining the sort of pile on to the RLPA uh, that they've spoiled everything. Um, uh, but nevertheless, they're the things that, interest me uh, from watching footy from the 80s, since the 80s. I, I don't know about uh, you, Tony, but I, I felt if they were trying to uh, deny us something, then they did. They did deny something. Unfortunately, they also denied Bradman Best what I would call a, a page in his scrapbook. Um, I know these days people don't actually physically cut things out, but <laughs> right alongside the photo of him scoring a try, and I guess now it's a digital thing or it's a memory, there's headlines about things he said and stuff he said at full time that we'll never say again because no one was there to ask him. Um, so it is possible to have those two views. They're not uh, mutually exclusive. You can you can say you missed hearing from the player at full time and still say that this is why we missed out and, and that's fair enough. Yeah, all, all good points. But um, what I did enjoy... Uh when you mentioned Bradman Best, is hearing from his mum and dad. And uh, his mum was just about in tears, uh, as you'd expect. His dad was very emotional. Uh, we also got to hear from Billy Slater's wife about uh, just uh, what it meant to her winning the series and, of course, uh, uh, what, it, what it meant to Billy. So uh, we, we sort of got to see a, a different side of things. Uh, Channel 9 got a bit creative and uh, they obviously decided, well, we can't talk to the uh, the players. We'll, we'll talk talk to their loved ones and uh, there, there were some good emotional quotes and uh, it was better than uh, you know one game at a time and yeah we we got a clean sweep and oh we would have liked a clean sweep players do tend to talk in cliches as you well know uh, whereas the parents it's it's very off the cuff very raw and I, I found that quite entertaining yeah I think people have forgotten you know um, what it used to be like and how an interview can be uh, with follow-up questions. I mean, that's the thing. You ask follow-up questions and you you find things out. You ask one question and, and you get a cliche. And it's almost like a, it's not, I don't know if it's a lost art, but it's certainly a forgotten art as far as the, the viewers and, and readers are concerned. Um, they, they think that players at full time is just cliches and that's all it is, you know, and they don't miss it at all. What was what I was going to say to you, Tony, is do you have any mail as to whether how long this continues? Is everything back to normal this weekend? I'm really not sure, Steve. I, I think the RLPA is playing it by year um, in the hope that they'll pressure the NRL into uh, sitting down uh, at the table again and uh, having talks and having their demands met. Um, I think they're, they're tired of being labelled a toothless tiger, uh, which they have been for you know the last 20, 30 years. The, the Players Association was always considered a bit of a joke and this is the strongest stance I, I can certainly remember by them and I'm, I'm sure you're the same so uh Clint Newton he's, he's sticking to his guns and uh it'll be interesting to see uh, exactly what the next move is I think uh, boycotting the Dally M's was a step up from from this uh really so I guess that was even more um uh, militant if you want to use that word it's not really yeah that's true that 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 was a big one that that certainly hurt the NRL because that, that was their their gala night so we all went to Fox Studios like and had we all went to Fox Studios and had the Keithy C's named after Keith Cole it was a it just a, we didn't miss anything killed the same number of brain cells just didn't have to rent a dinner suit so it was it was pretty pretty good all around um Tony you've um you've um you've you've put the call out for questions from uh from your readers uh what have you got for us, Tony? I knew you'd have to put those glasses on eventually. Yeah, it's cool getting old, Steve. What I do uh, is I just don't. I, I if I don't if I'm not going to have to read anything, I don't have them on at all. And if I know I'm going to have to, I put them on to start. Anyway, right. what have you got? 
Well, the first one's from uh, a good uh, fellow, the Rugby League Shadow. He's a, he's a fanatical rugby league man, and he's asked a very good question, probably the, the question most people are asking around about now. Where do you see the next NRL team being located, and when do you think is the right time frame for their introduction? So uh, you go first on this one, Steve. Well, the, the, where I see it, generally speaking, there's two answers, like, I may not agree with where I see. I may not agree with my answer to either, but but I, I, I think there, from what we've heard from the negotiations with the RLPA, um, they are looking at sort of Brisbane slash Papua New Guinea, and they're looking at it in about three years. Um, now, I would go the other way. I'd, I'd go Perth, uh, and I'd wait five years. But, I mean, so so... You know what they're planning to do and what they should do are two different things. Yeah, that's right. I I agree with you. I I, I think if we're going to call ourselves the National Rugby League, we've got to basically get away from the uh, the East Coast and uh, go to Perth, where there's definitely a market. Uh, I've been over there a couple of times to cover rugby league matches and been quite pleasantly surprised by the number of expats, uh, the number of Kiwis who are all mad uh, rugby league fans who, who would love their own team. Uh, we, of course, had the Western Reds, uh, back in the 90s, and they had some success. They certainly got some crowds. Uh, I'd uh, be a little more radical than you. I'd bring them in in two or three years, bearing in mind we look at the Dolphins and their stunning success, and they've done it in what uh, at what time frame do they have? A couple of years, three yeah, years? Yeah, a couple of years, a couple of years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've I've got to put my hand up. I thought uh, the Dolphins would win three to five games this year. So to me, they've they've been the feel good story of the year. I mean, they're they're great to watch. They they they're never dead. You know, they can be thirty points down, and next thing you know, they've made a game of it. Uh, they might not necessarily win it, and they've found the going tough the last few weeks. Um, you know, they've found a, a long season, injuries and suspensions, and Origin have caught up with them. But they're still in there punching, and uh, good luck to them. And I think Wayne Bennett and Christian Wolf have done a marvellous job. And, uh, you know, the, I think it's fair to say they're just about everyone's second favourite team at the moment. Next question, Tony. Next question. Uh, uh, a fellow called uh, The Legend of Sport uh, says... Do any of your uh, readers have normal names? They all use <laughs> aliases uh, like, like the mole. Uh, <laughs> the Legends of Sport has come out and said there's a strong rumour Queensland lost on purpose to keep Fred Fittler as New South Wales coach. Well, we've sort of just discussed that uh, legend, but I think we're uh, all a bit tongue-in-cheek when we uh, take that, um, that approach. Uh, now, the next one is from someone called... WTF dash, you can't be seen. Uh, geez, these names are getting uh, even more bizarre. <laughs> uh, what potentially is the most corruptible rule in our modern game for the ref to throw a game? Well, let me start by saying I, I don't believe refs throw games. I think refs make terrible mistakes, and I think the bunker makes terrible mistakes, but I certainly don't think they throw it. But uh, if if you're looking for something that's very contentious, I would say the, the ruck rule, the holding down, the wrestle, you could penalise probably three tackles out of every six for that. Uh, sometimes refs turn a blind eye. They like the game to flow. Uh, other times uh, they crack down on it early in the hope that we'll, we'll get a fast, clean game. What's your take on that, Steve? Refs can't win games, so refs can't throw games. But... <laughs> But they get you. I think he means fix a game, um, and yes. I don't think. Look, I, I'm, I don't. I don't can't think of one instance where where I've thought that happened I, after all these years, and I'm really, really old. But um, the six again is uh, is a lottery. Uh, and I know over, over here in England, Tony Smith uh, blew up about it at the weekend, saying it ruins a match. But certainly, a six again um, is is really to me. There's a lot of interpretation. Uh, and I'm not sure that, like, we had two referees for four or five years. We might have six again for four or five years, and then I reckon it'll go away again. Right. Uh, now we've got Skinny Bob wants to know who's going to play in the big dance on grand final day, and do you rate my eels? You take this one first, Steve. Uh, I think 
I think the I think the I'm going to tip the Warriors to make the grand final, and their opponents. Hmm. Um, Souths have sort of started to fall away, haven't they? Mm, maybe, 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 maybe we'll have an all out of uh, New South Wales grand final again. I think maybe only the second or third time we've had that. And I, I'm tipping the Broncos and the Warriors. How about that one? Geez, that'd uh, that'd upset a few people in Sydney, wouldn't it? But uh, mate, I I take the opposite approach to you as far as Souths, uh, having watched. Uh, Cody Walker just ripped Queensland the shreds out wide uh, last night and also Cam Murray and uh, Big Keon uh, in, in the back row. He, he was outstanding. I'm starting to get a, a new respect for South. I don't – they've been a bit up and down. But I reckon uh, South and Penrith, I, I, I just can't go past Penrith. Uh, Ivan Cleary, who coincidentally was sitting in the uh, New South Wales coaches box, um, you know, he seems to have the Midas touch at the moment. I think uh, Souths and Penrith and Skinny Bob, your eels, maybe uh, third or fourth. Uh, the next one's, next one's from uh, Joe Davola. Uh, uh, this is a real name, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Although he goes by the alias of Norberg, so maybe I shouldn't have given that away. And he's asked a, a, a very uh, good question. Uh, is Anthony Seabold digging his own grave at Manly with these Isaac Moses signings? Uh, I'll, I'll kick off this one. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a real uh, problem in the game when uh, managers get a hold of a coach and start sending his players there. Uh, we've seen it manly um, uh, Aaron Woods, who, who's getting near the end of his career. Lovely fellow, Aaron, but uh, he, he sent him there and he, he's getting regular first grade. He sent Cooper Johns there, a, a, a fringe first grader. And I think he's planning to send a few more there. Um, so, yeah, managers can have a bit of a hold on coaches and um, teams. Uh, is, is that how you see it, Steve? Yeah, I don't really know enough. Is 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 Anthony Seabold also managed by Isaac Moses? Or yes, he is. That's, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, you, I mean, I don't know, but I guess you would hope someone at the club, if you're a stakeholder at Manly, like a fan, for instance, that the club would be have the same question, and the club would be asking Anthony those questions too. So that's all you can really hope is that that we're not the only ones talking about this. It's being talked about internally. Yeah, that's right. Now, Darren Jones uh, is asking another question that's uh, very topical. Are the Tigers going to survive with the current board, CEO and chairman? We seem doomed. You start that one, Steve. They're going to survive because they get a cut of TV money. I mean, like, I mean, you know, the NRL does isn't in the – It's we don't have – you don't have promotion and relegation in the NRL. So – um, you know that they, they, they get their, they get their cut of the of the TV money, and that pays their bills and keeps opening the doors every day. And um, whether they, you know, are successful on the field, that's an, that's a, that's another matter. But as businesses, you're not going to go broke because they're losing. That isn't the way it works in Australia or in the NRL. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I think what Darren was was more getting at is, um, you know, are they going to be competitive I, I think that's what he means and uh things aren't looking great you know they're, they're still missing out on on players they're they're after they're they're chasing Brody Croft at the moment who they think might be the answer to their halfback woes I know he's been killing it over there in Super League but uh whether they can lure him or not uh we all know a that very long-term um, contract Tony signed like a seven-year contract yeah he's, he's, he does have a seven-year deal but I'm pretty sure at the end of every year He's got seven get out clauses. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and you, you know, that's the way it works with most NRL guys that when they go over there and sign a long term deal, they invariably have a, a get out clause for just a, an occasion like this. Uh, he's done a couple of years, uh, he's improved his game, his confidence. We saw Jackson Hastings do the same. We've, we've, seen uh, a couple of other guys do the same we've seen Jack Cogger for instance he's been playing really well at uh, Penrith after a couple of years over in England so um yeah Brody, Brody Croft but but basically things are uh, untenable at the Tigers at the moment uh the coaches uh, Benji Marshall and uh, Tim Sheens aren't on the same page as the CEO and chairman uh someone's got to go and uh, I guess it's just 
uh, remains to be seen who that is. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Steve Matthew Oliver's asked a, a very good question. Uh, if an Australian team was picked at the moment, who would be number seven? He says, uh, I feel Cleary is a, a great club player, but really hasn't stamped his authority in rep football uh, and went missing in the World Cup. If it wasn't for Munster and Grant, we may well have lost. Uh, it's a fair point. Uh, who do you reckon will be Australia's halfback if we picked a team at the moment? Well, it's tied to how, it's tied to how we start the show, isn't it, with the CBA? Because that's why we haven't heard any internationals at the end of the year because there's a debate over how they are funded and it's part of the um, the sort of tete-a-tete -tete between the NRL and the RLPA. So I certainly hope we do see Australia uh, playing this year. Someone called the Australian team a museum piece on social media this week and it, not, not far off the, you know, sun. I remember when they used to pick an Australian team and they used to play games. It was way back. I remember when they went to England and they actually played England instead of last year when they came over here and didn't go anywhere near playing England. So, um, um, but I, I think Nathan Cleary is one of the best players in the world. I, it would be a big call to, to, you know, the best four or five players in the world. So, be a huge call to leave him out of an Australian team. I'd be, I'd be putting. Him. Yeah, I tend to agree. And uh, the, the the guys who played Origin, that that, that was their chance to, I guess, uh, impress for their um, what do we call it, the uh, fantasy Australia team. And uh, uh, neither of them really. Um, grab the spot uh, in Cleary's absence. So I think when he's back from his um, hamstring injury, which could even be this weekend, I think Nathan Cleary will, will re-establish himself. And uh, after a bit of a break, I, I think he's set for a, a big final series. And, and that's one of the reasons why I tipped um, uh, the Panthers to go all the way to the grand final. Uh, now, see, we, we, we've got a few more questions, but uh, time is tight. So thanks for sending them in, guys, and we'll get to them next week, I promise. Now, we've had a couple of results in some underage international, or sorry, interstate games, Tony, uh, which we should uh, record. Uh, Queensland under-19s in the women, uh, 2014 over New South Wales. And in the men, it was uh, New South Wales getting a win 32-14 um, in the under-19s. Um, now... Tony, we're, we're sort of going to move on from last week where we just did NRL tips with both of us. I'm going to get your NRL tips and you're going to get my Super League tips, obviously leaving out uh, Thursday night because uh, this program will uh, be posted after Thursday night uh, Super League match. So, um, uh, Tony, you ready? Yeah, ready to go. Newcastle and West Tigers. Yeah, I like the uh, the Knights here. They're, they're very short priced, as as you'd expect. Uh, the the line's about 11 and a half, but uh, with Bradman best on a high, I'm, I'm assuming he's playing. Uh, I think that think the Knights will uh, just be too strong for the poor Tigers who just can't take a trick at the moment. Canterbury and Brisbane on Saturday. Yeah, I... Uh, the. The Bulldogs have been a little bit up and down. They got thumped the other week, then they they came back and, and won last week. Uh, but the Broncos, even though they'll have players backing up, uh, probably have a couple of players out, uh, an away game for them. But I see the Broncos uh, winning by 10 to 12 points. And that's exciting, isn't it, if you're a Doggies fan because the game's back at Belmore. Over at Four Pines Park, Manly and North Queensland. Yeah, I see this as one of the games of the round. Uh, uh, Manly, of course, uh, vying for a, a final spot. They're actually on um, in 10th spot at the moment, uh, just one point outside the eight. And uh, the Cowboys have, have really experienced a bit of, bit of a resurgence uh, and some of their players certainly stood up in origin. Uh, so I'm tipping the Cowboys, another away winner. Another historic venue, the Sydney Cricket Ground. Sydney Roosters entertaining Melbourne. Yeah, the Roosters haven't done it for me this year. They're, they're in 13th spot. Uh, admittedly, they're only a win out of the eight. But I see the Roosters missing the eight, and I think uh, this will add to their woes with a win to Melbourne. And a couple more. Well, it's actually well, it's like a full round this week, right? Um, Seven so, games we've got. We're, we're yeah. missing one. Missing one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the Warriors and Cronulla. 
Yeah, it's about even money, this one, but uh, this is one of these games I'd, I'd favour whoever's at home. So I'm taking the Warriors purely on uh, the home ground advantage. Uh, the, the Sharks will have to travel over there. The Warriors are un, unaffected by origin, uh, having a great run under Andrew Webster and uh, uh, with a full house paying him on. I can see him taking the points here and solidifying their spot in the eight. And that one's at Mount Smart. This one is at Redcliffe, Dolphin Oval, KO Park, whatever it's called this week. Uh, and it's the Dolphins and Pens. Yeah, as I said uh, earlier in the show, Steve, I think the Dolphins have really hit the wall and uh, uh, they, they're giving away 14 start. And I think they'll need every one of them. I, I can see the Panthers uh, maybe running away with this, assuming all their origin players back up. And as I said, clearly some hope of, of playing. Uh, I can see a fairly comfortable Panthers win. Now, Eels don't have arses, but if they did, these Eels, theirs would be sore from last week. Uh, and they are taking on, uh, they are taking on Gold Coast at uh, out at Combank Stadium in the, our final game of round twenty, Tony. Yeah, and of course they did get thumped last week, but they had three big outs uh, to Origin: uh, Mitchell Moses, Campbell Gillard, and Gufferson, and it just showed how valuable those three are. Uh, they're all back in. Uh, I think Fafita's in doubt for the Titans. For me, the Eels at home. Tony, and your turn. You're going to get some Super League tips off me. Okay, Steve, uh, now your turn in the hot seat. Uh, uh, first game for you is the Giants against uh, Wakefield Trinity. Yeah, and um, for the people listening, I'm going to hear from Mark Applegarth after, after this, uh, just for the people on the audio podcast. But, um, yeah, I, I, Wakey are on a roll. Uh, they, they beat Wigan last week. I think they continue and uh, they make... Huddersfield, Huddersfield, though, coming off a win against uh, Catalans away. So it's a tough one, but I'm going to go for Wakey. Fair enough. Uh, the next game is uh, my uh, team, uh, Warrington Wolves, against Wigan Warriors. Yeah, it's a big match. I'm actually heading up to Wigan, um, and I'm going to watch it in a pub with Phil Wilkinson, actually. I'm not going to go to the game because Phil's uh, he's, he's, he's left the business now. So so uh, you can't really go to someone's place, show up at midnight and crash and leave the next morning. So we're going to watch it together <laughs> in the pub. Um, yeah, I, I, um, Warrington really much improved last weekend. Wigan beaten by Wakey. Um, I can only go on last week's form. Um, I think it's going to be a really tight match, really, really tight match. Uh, but I think I, I think Warrington will turn the corner and, and they'll get up by a point or two. Right. Next one, Leeds Rhinos, coached by my uh, good mate uh, Rowan Smith against Hull KR. Yeah, Hull KR last week uh, beaten in the Derby, Derby, whoever you want to pronounce it. Leeds are kind of, again, they, they may have turned a bit of a corner now. They, they, they seem to be on the improve a controversial win over uh, Salford last week. Uh, I, I, I think I think Leeds. I think I think Le- Leeds there um, with um, Hull KR, as I said, beaten last week in, in Derby and things looking up for the Rhinos. All righty, Hull FC against uh, Cass. Hull, uh, Yorkshire Derby there, uh, Tony and uh, and Cass sort of under under pressure now with um, Wakey getting a couple of wins as far as relegation. Is concerned. I, I I would say I'm going to go for Hull FC there. All righty. In the last game, Salford Red Devils against the Lee Leopards. Yeah, Salford. Uh, their fans very upset last week at some refereeing calls. We talked about that earlier uh, in the in the in the program about people thinking that referees deliberately uh, fix results, which, as far as I know, does not happen. I can't say it's never happened in a bush league or it never happened in the '60s. But in my experience, you know, I've seen no concrete evidence of it happening. Uh, so that so stop bagging the refs. Uh, but I think uh, Salford um, Salford are struggling a bit at the mo- you know they kind of hit hit a bit of a wall mi- mid season. Uh, so I'm going to tip a Salford defeat in that match. All righty. See you, everyone. And and if you're listening, by the way, uh, we're going to have a chat to Mark Applegarth. <laughs> hey, Mark. You, given what you said about. Josh Griffin being one of the leading forwards in Super League. You'd be surprised to read this morning that Hull were going to release him. They weren't going to renew his contract. Um, 
Not really, because, you know, I've done, Hull will have their own recruitment strategy and plans that they'll be focusing on, you know, so I, I don't really stress about that. I've just identified players that I feel would have value to us at Wakefield. You know, Josh has got an attachment to Wakefield. Uh, he's grown up in Wakefield. Um, it's a club close to his heart, and I just thought it'd be a great value bringing him back, um, you know, to help us in this transitional period that we're in. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really look at what were going on at Hull you know once we realised it was a possibility um, we just focused on ourselves so yeah didn't really look at that whatsoever and um, you know, given your relationship with him do you discuss why he's currently suspended because there's still a discrepancy between the finding and what he claims happened you know there's a bit of been a bit of to and pro do, do you discuss that I think you just draw a line in the sand you know what's happened's happened um, he's accepted his punishment uh, he's back in contention, um, you know, at the start of August, around there. So, um, yeah, I've not really spoke to him about that. Not really spoke to him. You know, it's in the past. It's happened. Um, you know, he's accepted what, what punishment's been given to him. Um, we just move on from there, really, yeah. And, mate, finally from me, um, obviously everyone's talking about now um, promotion and relegation and whether you can get out of danger and talk about where Huddersfield are on the table and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. As a coach... What about the other factors that come into play next year that, that are about LED scoreboards and, and population size and all that sort of stuff? I mean, do you allow do you allow that to cross your mind that it's not just about winning and you might get out of danger this year, but the, then all these other things come into play next year, you know? Yeah, no, I've had a quick glance of it. I mean, firstly, to answer your question, as coach, you just control what you can control, which is, is coaching the team. But yeah, I've had some chats with the board and things and when you come to Bellevue, you see that new stand being built and there's a new screen and and they're doing all that sort of stuff. So you'd be an idiot not to see that there's been a lot of investment getting put in, uh, you know, on other things. But I think it can only be good for the sport. You know, I think if you're, if you're a bit older like we are and you, you've grown up coming to some of these older grounds, you obviously have that nostalgia and that because it... it, it it floats childhood memories. You know, you might have seen a memorable game down at a ground. I remember coming to Bellevue as a kid and, you know, watching some cracking games. And I, I remember the North Stand when you could skip over the fence and, um, you know, get in that way. But, you know, there's no hiding away from the fact that modern sport, people want to come to modern facilities. Um, you know, they want it to be an experience. Um, and I think it can only be good for gaming long run. That it's not only what... What you're doing on the field, I mean, that still needs to be a massively important thing. You know, you've still got to have a uh, a competitive team and a, and a successful brand in that sense. Um, but you also need to make sure that your facilities are, are fitting for the 21st century. And I know here at Wakefield, we've, the board's been putting in hell of a lot of work to, you know, to try and modernise things because it were well overdue. You know, I'm a Wakefield lad and um, it was getting a bit embarrassing, uh, you know, over the last three, four years, looking at the ground and, and that old East stand when it were up, um, you know, there's no hiding away from the fact it needed modernising. So I think if if there is criteria out there that, you know, that, that gives people a framework to follow and, and, and get the self so that everyone can be at the top table, um, it can only be good for the sport, can't it? Because it should create more uh, attractive clubs throughout the league, which is going to create more more sponsorship and, and better broadcasting. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of different because like a, a team like Keithley, you know, they're, they're, if they perform on the field, they don't think they should be punished for being in a small town. But you're in a city, so you've almost yeah. got to justify the the size of your audience with a good team, haven't you? You're you're the yeah. other way. You've got to the results have to keep pace with the other good things that that are happening in your club. You know. Yeah, I think I think that's it. He's still got that relationship between it, so it's definitely put. Put a bit of food for thought for a lot of people. But as I said, like I personally think um modernizing stadium and, and creating that match day experience can only be good for for rugby league in the whole. You know, the more um attractive packages we have in terms of teams that are, are flourishing on and off the field, um, you know, the stronger the sport becomes, doesn't it? So you know, it should be good in the long run, really. When you when you um got appointed Someone said on TV they'd never heard of you. Last yeah. week, last week you beat Wigan, uh, <laughs> and maybe you avoid relegation if things go well. Do you reflect on that? Do you reflect on your own personal reputation that you're building and the fact that, like I said, there was a bit of drama when you got appointed 
yeah, because of what I said. Do, do you do you allow yourself to reflect on that? No, of course. I, I know it sounds real cliche, but you just control what you can control. Um, I don't really listen to that outside noise. You know, obviously you get told about it. I think it upset my wife more than anything else. Um, it is what it is. You know, you, you shouldn't be in these jobs if you can't take the excuse me the criticism or the the things like that you know when you accept that people are just doing the job and you know a journalist gets paid to write opinion um, or give opinion uh, so you, when you kind of accept it for that sort of stuff you don't take it personal if you don't think per, don't take it personal then it can't affect you can it you know as long as uh, I feel I'm being true to myself uh, that the people that I care about and I know care about me can be honest with me. That's all that really matters to me.